Hello everyone, welcome back. Well, we're having some proper summer temperatures, but of course it's already September and birds are migrating. As you might know, it's adults that leave first and juveniles that follow. Sandra from our customer care department just had a juvenile rose-breasted grosbeak visit her bird feeders. So this is a quick reminder to keep your feeders filled this time of the year, but also to place your feeders within a safe distance from your windows. It is during migration that window collisions increase. So there is a rule. You can place your feeders either three feet and closer to your windows. You can actually buy one of those suction cup hangers and hang your feeder uh, attached to the window, or you can get a bracket and place it close to the window. If that's not possible, then please place your feeders 30 feet and more from your windows. Have you ever witnessed a murmuration of starlings? It's so mesmerizing. Bill Dalgard from Washington has three questions about it. First, who decides who is going to be the leader of that particular murmuration? And then how and when does the leader decide that the flock should change its direction? And finally, are any of the starlings welcome to join the flock or are some of them excluded? Hi, Bill. Great questions. I have seen these huge wheeling masses of starlings ranging from 500 to 100,000 birds on a number of occasions myself, and they are beyond a doubt one of the most spectacular ornithological events one can witness. Among other names, they're generally referred to as murmurations. Apparently the starlings are moving at speeds of excess of 90 miles an hour, which begs the question, what keeps them from colliding? And your specific question, which bird decides the given direction of the flock? Years ago, I met a wildlife photographer who specialized in taking photos of these eye-catching ornithological spectacles. And upon examining the photos quite closely, one could invariably see a raptor, like a falcon or a hawk, constantly worrying the flock, trying to pick off one of the outside birds. That's what drives the starlings to bunch together and then spread apart. No bird wants to be on the outside. The current thought to date on how the starlings maneuver through the air en masse is as follows. It's a nearest neighbor phenomenon. Each starling only communicates with about a half a dozen or so birds closest to itself. They basically follow their cues and copy their movements in a process known as scale-free correlation. So when one bird moves, its nearest neighbors respond in like fashion, and this propagates a wave-like movement pulsing through the entire flock. However, while I agree with this notion, I have my own personal hypothesis about how each bird detects the movements of its neighbor. It's widely known among ornithologists that all birds, including starlings, have many sensory receptors embedded in their skins, which can detect air pressure. I think that these birds use these receptors to feel pressure waves emanating from the flapping wings of their neighbors and instinctively respond by flying in the same direction but keeping enough distance to avoid collision. Not easy for me to prove, of course, but if I could, it would make news all over the world. As much as I love gardening and taking care of my flowers, this is the time of the year when I just leave them be and I don't do anything to them until springtime. I know it can be very tempting to cut everything down and clean up your flower beds, especially after you have a night of frost. But believe me, your birds and your bugs will be very grateful if you don't cut down any of your flowers. I would have to say that the flocking together of 500 to 100,000 Eurasian starlings in those huge masses has to rank among the top 10 avian spectacles in the world. Watching them close ranks and then spread out in undulating fashion in the sky is absolutely breathtaking. While these events are usually called murmurations, other names come to mind, like a congregation or a vulgarity of starlings. But why a murmuration? Well, some consider a murmur to be akin to a low, subtle rumble, and apparently if you get close enough to one of these flocks, the sound of the beating wings mimics that. The birds generally begin this behavior as early as September and continue throughout fall and winter months. The most common time of day to see a murmuration is in the evening as the starlings gather together to enter their roosts for the night. 
They can last anywhere from five to 45 minutes. The best strategy to see one is to go to a known large starling roost at about an hour before sunset and wait until the sun goes down. Some of the best places to see them in North America are Central Park and Sunset Lake in New York City, Saguaro National Park, Arizona, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge and Indian River Lagoon in Florida, and Bay Verte Peninsula in Newfoundland. If you're in the UK, you can't beat the pier in downtown Brighton. Believe me, when you witness one of these flights, you will never forget it. We just spent a week in the Bay of Fundy in a lighthouse keeper's cottage. So we were surrounded by a lot of marine life. So I'm really into ducks, herons and eagles. So today it's C for common mergansers, a sea duck that lives both in North America and in Eurasia. Birds in general are called barometers of nature's health and scientists watch and study common mergansers to be able to tell how healthy their aquatic environment and its inhabitants are. So if there are common mergansers around, things are good. I find it super easy to ID common mergansers. They're long, red or bright orange bills with the hook at the end and their head crest are very distinctive. Males have iridescent green heads. Females are kind of grayish with beautiful cinnamon rusty heads. When checking eBird data, I noticed that these birds don't mind cold weather at all and they will overwinter in areas that have snow and ice. As long as there's open water, they'll stay there. Fish is their diets. They love salmon and trout. They dive to get fish and often will even swallow a fish while still submerged. They breed in freshwater lakes and rivers and they nest in tree cavities and really don't mind man-made nesting boxes. So if you have access to a river or a lake, please put up a box for them. Now is the best time to do that because they return to their breeding grounds rather early, sort of in March. And if your box is a success, you will have baby chicks year after year. Please visit Nestwatch to get the right dimensions for their box. Common mergansers have only one brood per season, but their clutches are quite large, eight to 12 eggs. You've probably seen those cute pictures of mama mergansers carrying a chick or two on her back and the rest of them trailing behind. So adorable. Well, goodbye for now. I hope you'll get to see some migratory birds at your feeders. Take care, everyone. I'll catch you in two weeks.